In our Thursday evening growth group, we're studying the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. And in the final chapter of that Old Testament book, there's a great section which has always struck me as beautifully written. And it's describing the reality of what it's like to have an ageing body. Uh, let me read to you from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds but all their songs grow faint, when people are afraid of heights and dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire is no longer stirred, then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. There's a whole series of metaphors there which describe how as we get older our physical bodies start to let us down. According to the teacher of Ecclesiastes, uh, we're likely to lose our teeth. The grinders cease because they are few. Uh, poor eyesight, those looking through the windows grow dim. You can't see the people who are looking at you. Um, there's losing your hearing. People rise up at the sound of birds but their songs grow faint. Increasing anxiety, afraid of heights, dangers in the streets. The almond tree blossoms. Almond blossoms are white. So it's an image of hair uh, losing your colour and going white. And then the grasshopper dragging itself along and desire is no longer stirred. It's a loss of libido. So according to the teacher whose voice we hear in the book of Ecclesiastes, as we get older, our senses become less sharp, our looks degrade, our bodies let us down when we're trying to make love. To be an embodied person means to experience weakness. That's a reality of getting older. And it's not only when you're old. Infirmity can hit you at any stage of life. Our passage today sees both Jesus and his disciples in a very weak moment. And uh, they're all much younger than me. Uh, Jesus, at this stage in the story wouldn't be much older than, than his early 30s. The disciples were probably aged from their late teens up to maybe a few years younger than Jesus. We, we, think, we don't realise how young this group of people actually were. Um, they were young, but here we see them in a vulnerable position. And yet, while some in this passage give in to that vulnerability... Jesus emerges triumphant from his wobbly moment. Everyone's experiencing weakness in this Bible reading. Some give in to it. Jesus emerges triumphant. Now, why is that important? And what possibly could make the difference between the two? There is hope here for people who want to follow Jesus but feel very weak. There's also a warning for those who are a little overconfident, those people who think they're stronger than what they actually are. The theme is about human weakness. That's what we're looking at today. And um, whether that's something that overcomes us or whether that is something that we in turn overcome. We'll start by looking at the portrait of human fragility that's painted in these scenes. As we've noted in previous weeks, the prophecy, the prophecy from Jesus hits a high point as he heads towards the cross. Here he is quoting a verse from the Old Testament as he predicts that his disciples will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Peter's response that he can't imagine him doing anything of the sort. Verse 29, Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. So Peter is full of bravado here, boasting in his own strength 
to withstand the pressure as the heat is dialed up. He doesn't think that he's weak. He doesn't think that he'll fail. I remember when I was a student, there was a three kilometre course that I used to run around, around the campus where I studied. I would go jogging, and then some fellow students who were also runners invited me to join them on a bay run. Now, if you've ever uh, lived in the inner west, or you've done exercise in the inner west, you will know what the bay run is. A seven kilometre course around Iron Cove, starting at Dremoyne, or start wherever you like, but it's seven kilometres all the way around Iron Cove there in the inner west of Sydney. I said, sure, I'm fit. My body's capable, as if I won't be able to keep up with you. <laughs> uh, I was full of confidence, but when the time came, my body let me down. The reality was I had to stop at five kilometres and walk the rest of the way while the, uh, the two friends that I was running with uh, strided ahead and had to wait for me at the end. Spiritually, we can make a similar mistake, can't we? We can be full of bravado. I'd never stoop so low as to steal. I don't think I'm going to fall into sexual temptation. I don't think I will ever deny Jesus as my Lord. Uh, but Paul warns us, doesn't he, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. A warning against bravado, spiritual bravado. We're weaker than what we think. Uh, Peter and his friends are about to find this out for real because the reality of human infirmity becomes apparent as Jesus and his disciples move into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden, not only do we see the reality of human weakness, we also see its diversity because there is spiritual weakness here as well as physical weakness. Um, both are related, actually. Both are important. Looking at Jesus first, his is a spiritual fragility in that he doesn't want to complete the task that his father has set before him. Skip down to verse 36. Abba, Father. Abba being an intimate uh, Aramaic term for father. Jesus spoke Aramaic. That was his, his native tongue. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. What was it that unnerved him? Was it the prospect of physical pain as he was strung up on a Roman cross? I think certainly that was part of it. It's got to be part of it, right? When you know that's what's ahead, you've got to be thinking about that. But it seems here that his wobbly moment probably actually went deeper than that. He refers to the cup and he prays, take this cup from me. Now the cup is an Old Testament image of God's anger and judgment with regard to human sin. When God is judging the sinful nations around Israel, he, he talks about you know, forcing them to drink the cup of his wrath. It's an image of God's anger. And here Jesus is praying that this cup has been given to him. And so th there's a sense of despair and distress at the prospect, not only of being physically killed in such a horrific way, but of bearing God's anger for, of, about the sin of the world that would come down upon him. And that seems to be the thing that's really kind of unnerving him at the moment. Nonetheless, it was the Father's will that Jesus take on this role and it's a role that Jesus agrees to despite his hesitation. Yet not my will, but your will. And remember, Jesus is both fully God and fully human. So what we see here is a very human form of weakness. We've all had experiences where we don't want to go through with what it is that God has placed before us. No, I don't want to speak up for Christ. No, I don't want to forgive those who sin against me. No, I don't want to reform my speech. I don't want to stay loyal to my spouse. I don't want to let go of my possessions or whatever it is that God is asking of us through the scriptures. There are countless little missions, little, little prompts towards holiness, little directions and avenues that God wants us to go down, which are all there available for us to learn through the scriptures. But so often we encounter this spiritual weakness where we just don't want to do what it is that God has asked us to do. 
not unrelated to the physical weakness that we also see here in this passage. Let's look at the disciples now. That's Jesus' weakness. The disciples' experience in the garden is that their bodily limitations let them down here. Jesus knows this is a moment of trial and temptation for them as well as him. He asks them to keep watch and pray so that they will not fall into temptation. The temptation to abandon Jesus at this pivotal moment. That's the temptation that Jesus knows is swirling around. But can they do it? Can they resist this temptation to to run away from Jesus? Well, their bodies are working against them. In verse 37, Jesus returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. In verse 40, he came back and again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Then in verse 41, returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. Their tired bodies means they're unable to take the precautions that Jesus wants them to take. And the result is shameful. Cast your eyes down to the very end of our reading. Judas has arrived with an armed gang, which is complete overkill, not necessary. Jesus is seized. And what happens at verse 50? Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. We spoke a couple of weeks ago about Mark and sandwiches. This is Mark's habit of having one story in the middle and another bigger story kind of surrounding it at either end. This is not quite a Mark and sandwich, but it's another type of symmetry that Mark employs. Uh, Our passage opened with Jesus prophesying that the shepherd would be struck and the sheep would be scattered. And here at the end of our passage, we see that he was right. Despite all their boasting about loyalty, the disciples scatter. And it's all of them. It's not just Peter. Now, we often focus on Peter's failure, don't we? But earlier in the, in the reading, all the disciples joined in with Peter and said, yeah, we're not going to abandon you. And here at the end, we're told that everyone has fled. One of them flees naked, leaving his garment behind. Now, some scholars see here an echo of Genesis chapter 3. In another garden, the Garden of Eden, In that garden, when Adam and Eve were tempted and when they failed by eating the forbidden fruit, their nakedness is experienced as shame. And these scholars see this, uh, another form of nakedness, in the second garden here, the Garden of Gethsemane. And they suggest that this nakedness signifies the shame of sinful failure. And friends, it is shameful to deny Jesus. Earlier in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus said, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So as we, we've worked our way through this passage, we see a progression. We start with human bravado. Oh, I'm not going to fall away but then the reality of human weakness, which results in the the shame of human failure. Bravado, weakness, shame. That's the progression here. Last week, we were reminded of the dark, sinful reality that resides within each of our hearts, the reality that Jesus is able to see. Here we have another problem, which is just the weakness of the human condition. We're weak, And we are fragile, both spiritually and physically as well. And they interact with one another. We want to do well, but our bodies and our human condition, they let us down, don't they? What can we do? Well, in the middle of all this failure, we have Jesus who manages to see a way way through. Remember, he's feeling weak at this point too. His moment of weakness, however, is just that, a moment. It's overcome with this renewed resolve to be committed to the task that's set before him. Uh, Let's hear his determination in verse 41. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. 
here comes my betrayer. He literally stands and walks and meets the danger head on. Doesn't run away, walks towards it. When we talk of the benefits of Christ's death for us, we're used to speaking about how on the cross Jesus takes on God's anger. And we certainly do see that here in this passage because Jesus talks about the cup. He's praying that the cup of God's wrath is being given to him and so he drinks it. He drinks it for us. But there is another way in which Christ's death is for us and it's this. Whereas the rest of us fail because of our feebleness, Christ was, over, was able to overcome his weakness and he did that for us. Christ perseveres where everyone else fails. He remains strong when everyone else gives in to their weakness. The failure of Adam and Eve in the garden is reversed by the faithfulness of Christ in this second garden. There's a great verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2 thir- verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 13 which I think summarizes what we see here in the garden of Gethsemane. If we are faithless, Paul writes, he meaning Jesus is faithful. If we are faithless and we so often are, Jesus on the other hand is faithful. Because he saw his mission through, he drank that cup that had, and absorbed God's anger over our failures. We are faithless, but he is faithful and he's faithful on our behalf. Imagine you're on a group camping trip and after a full day's hike, it's time to set up the camp and uh, you've been hiking all day, so you're a long way from where your cars are parked, even further from any shop. As you're setting up the tents and preparing the campsite for the night, someone calls out, Did anyone remember any matches? And uh, one by one, people respond, Oh, sorry, (laughs) forgot to pack them. No, I don't have any either. And so panic sets in as you realise that this is going to be one long hike without any fire for cooking and without any fire for warmth. What are you going to do? But then someone cries out, Yes, I have some. They shake the box of matches and they're dry as well. (laughs) Hallelujah, a saviour, a saviour who saved the trip. The faithfulness of one person who remembered the pack properly compensates for the faithlessness of everyone else who's failed to, to do what was required of them. And so it is with Jesus, who, because he is faithful, is able to compensate in the face of everyone else's weaknesses. And faced with our own fragility, Jesus invites us to rely on his own faithfulness, to admit that our own intentions, sometimes they're just that, aren't they? They're just intentions. We, we don't come through with what it is we intend to do for God or in, in loyalty to him. And so we rely on his faithfulness and to ask that we be forgiven on account of what his faithfulness has achieved for us. I think that's the gospel heart of the passage we're looking at today. Surrounded by faithlessness, which we so often identify with, Jesus himself is found to be faithful. And that's good news for us. But Christ's perseverance not only provides cover for our weakness, it also provides a model for us to, uh, to aspire to. Our mission as a church is not only to help people meet Jesus and trust in Jesus, which they need to do because Jesus is the one who's faithful for us, but it's also to become more like him. Once we place our trust in him, we start to imitate the one who is faithful. We want to learn to overcome our own weakness with strength. Jesus provides a great example here for us to to meditate on. And remember, I think for many Christians, it's very easy to say no to hard things. Jesus was asked to do a hard thing. He didn't want to. And we're all familiar with that feeling, aren't we? But he resisted that feeling of saying no, and he went ahead with it. He went ahead with it. I remember when I was just starting out in Christian ministry, I was asked to lead a group of students, university students, on a short-term mission trip to a nation overseas, which, according to my understanding at the time, was very hostile towards the gospel. Missionary activity, banned, illegal. And we were going with the hope of speaking about Christ, speaking about Christ in a a nation where this was frowned upon, 
and where you, you could get into trouble if the authorities decided to, to crack down hard on what it was that Christians feel they are called to do. I remember um, I didn't want to go. And uh, one of those asking me actually said, we're approaching you because you're not married and if something goes wrong, there's no family that will be affected. <laughs> Apparently my parents didn't count. Uh, it didn't matter if they were disappointed with me being ended up, ending up in a prison overseas somewhere, uh, as long as there were no wife and kids affected. Um, that, that didn't make me feel better when, when they said that to me. Uh, I, I really didn't want to go, but I prayed about it and I thought about it and, and I ended up coming to the conclusion that if I didn't go, that would be disobedience on my behalf. Um, I really felt there, there was a, a clear path of godliness in this situation, which was to do the work of an evangelist, right? Like to, to be involved in this, in this mission and it was only short term. Uh, it was well planned well thought out. We had good contacts in this country who had prepared a way for us. Uh, and so I went. Uh, the thing that was stopping me was fear of suffering for Christ's name. And that was not a good enough excuse. I was convinced of that by the scriptures. So I went. I did it. As, I, as it turned out, there was nothing to worry about. Because I, I learnt, and this is the beauty of going overseas in a different I learnt that their culture is very different to our culture. Here, we are very much under the rule of law. If there's a rule, and there's a, there's a, you can expect that it will be, as long as the, the, the officials have the capacity to do it, it it'll, those rules will be enacted. But in the country we were going, they had rules, but they were always interpreted by the local officials in their own local way. And where we were going, they were very happy for us to come in as Westerners, to come in as Christians. They even asked us, we were teaching English in a, in, a, in a school, and they even asked us to teach about Christmas. And as a Christian, what are you going to say? No, I'm not going to teach about why Jesus came into... Of course we did. We, we taught about Christmas. No problem at all. Looking back now, I think what God wanted to teach me was not so much a lesson about mission and persecution, but a lesson about leading other Westerners, because that was the difficulty. It was the team I brought with me. They were hard work. And I think that's what God was preparing me for, um, leadership of people from my own culture. Anyway, but for the few months beforehand, I was wrestling with what I thought was a hard ask and I wanted a way out. And we all want ways out of the different things God puts in front of us. But following the way of Jesus means what? It means standing up and walking ahead. That's what it means. We're moving into our final section on the sermon outline where I just want to take three verses in our passage and give a few more practical lessons for people in weak bodies. How can we make gains in overcoming the vulnerability we have that, com that comes with our human embodiment? What can we do? Well, first consider what Jesus says in the second half of verse 38. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's a good summary of the problem that our passage identifies. The spirit is willing. Peter's spirit was willing, but he, Jesus knew his flesh was weak. And so that was going to become an obstacle. It's worth knowing. We might aim for holiness, but our human bodies matter and they can become an obstacle with regard to what we're aiming for as Christian people. Some psychologists and counsellors use the acronym HALT. I don't know if you've heard of this. H-A-L-T, HALT. H stands for hunger. A stands for anger. L stands for loneliness. And T stands for tiredness. And they call these, um, what do they call them? Risk states, that's what they call them. States of being where the behaviour and performance that you'd like to achieve is put at risk. You, you, you might want to serve God with the purest of hearts and in all godliness and holiness, but if you are hungry, if you are angry, if you are lonely, and if you are tired, then that aim is put at risk. Um, if you're hungry, you might sin by stealing something to eat or by uh, 
by, by leading to, to anger. I mean, you've all heard of the term hangry, haven't you? <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when you're hungry, angry. Or if you're angry, you might sin by mouthing off something you regret or by using your fists. If you're lonely, pornography might become a strong temptation. And if you're tired, and we see this with the disciples, don't we? If you're tired, in their case, they were more susceptible to denying Christ. They didn't have that strength that was needed to watch and resist temptation. Attending to your body is a really important part of Christian discipleship. Because if if you're not attending to your body, you're much more easily led into sin. Remember that acronym, HALT, H-A-L-T, hunger, anger, loneliness, and when you're tired. A second tip, look at the second half of verse 32. Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. We shouldn't overlook the fact that prayer features quite significantly in this passage. It's a passage about prayer, isn't it? Uh, We shouldn't overlook this, uh, particularly when we compare Jesus and Peter. Jesus gives Peter the strategy that's needed for him to resist temptation. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. But Peter doesn't pray. He sleeps instead. And what is the result between the two? What's the difference between Jesus and Peter? Jesus, who is praying, maintains the path of obedience. Peter, who doesn't pray ends up failing. It's also interesting to, to see the comparison here. Jesus pray, goes to pray three times in the garden and uh, while Peter uh, fails to pray three times and then later on, as we'll see next week, there are three denials of Christ. Interesting, isn't it? Comparison between the two. The passage suggests that prayer is necessary. Necessary to resist temptation, to maintain the path of godliness. Peter thought he was able to do it on his own, but he couldn't. He needed God's strength, he needed God's help, he needed to pray. That's what he needed to do. It's not the first time Mark has taught this. In chapter 9, the disciples try and expel a demon from a boy, but they can't do it. They can't do it. And they come to Jesus and say, why couldn't we drive the demon out? And Jesus says, this type can only come out by prayer. The inference being the disciples hadn't prayed about it. But rather they said, full of bravado, right, here's a demon. Let's go slay the demon and expel the demon. We're going to go in. Yeah, get out of here, you demon. And get and the demon didn't go anywhere. Why couldn't they do it? It's because they were doing it in their own strength. They weren't praying to God. They needed God's help to expel the demon. Prayer is necessary. Um, a subtle lesson taught by Mark here as well as earlier in his gospel. Finally, final tip. Um, which is more something to be aware of, and it's a good thing to finish with. Look back at the beginning of our passage. Jesus prophesies that his disciples will run away, but then he says in verse 28, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. One final tip is to be assured that our failure is not final. Jesus prophesies that his disciples will will do the shameful act of abandoning him in his time of need. But he sees beyond that and he sees a time when he'll be raised from the dead and when he will rendezvous with his disciples in Galilee. He sees a future, an ongoing ministry. This failure is not going to be the final word. There'll be um, reconciliation, forgiveness and getting on with the task after he's been raised from the dead. And why is our failure not final? Well, it's because even though we are faithless, Christ has remained faithful. And through that faithfulness, enables us to be forgiven. That's a great thing to end on, isn't it? I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this passage of Scripture. We thank you for Christ and his faithfulness. A faithfulness which compensates for our faithlessness, which we experience and, uh, and give in to so many times. We do pray that we will be mindful of the difference that our weak bodies make, that we'll be wary of any sense of spiritual bravado that we might have and we might uh, see with sober reality the vulnerability that we each carry with us. 
We thank you for the forgiveness of Jesus, but we also pray that his example might be set before us and through the power of your Holy Spirit, we might learn to be strong in the face of weakness. And we do pray that you might be prompting us to pray, to continue to pray for that strength, um, given that is a key strategy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.